airport has $10 billion worth of work going on, and y'all need to be lined up to try to get some of this work. Everybody can't be a hair braided on a restaurant. Some of y'all have construction firms, IT firms, and some of you might have both IT firms, hair braiders, and restaurants. I know, I know, I know some of you, you know, I know y'all doing very well, but this uh, economic development that's going on at the airport and also in Philadelphia area is just phenomenal. So I'm gonna do it, just take a moment, introduce yourself, and let us know what you do, okay? Good afternoon. Um, what I currently do right now, I just want to say thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and really get a better understanding of what's going on in the council and what we as a people are doing in Philadelphia. Um, what I do, just a little bit, my name is Linda Joy Harris. Um, what I currently do is implement our strategic plan at the airport, uh, which means that anything that we say we're going to do um, to complete and fulfill our vision, uh, those are the things that I oversee. Um, so like I said, I'm excited to be here, and I definitely believe we're stronger together, and hopefully we will see um, some of you out of the airport next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, in reference to the airport, let me just say, uh, and I told my president and uh, the president of the Agorian Chamber of Commerce, we have been working with the, uh, the Economic Trade Promotion Office up in uh, New York for Côte d'Ivoire, and the Ethiopian Airlines. You know, Ethiopian Airlines is one of the few airlines that fly direct from the United States to Africa. Uh, they have two flights going from Newark to Benin and from JFK to Abidjan. And so they'll be here on April the 11th. We're doing a, 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 a Ivorian Business Roundtable to talk more about it. But the significance of it is, is that I'm talking to them about coming to Philadelphia International Airport and it's just talk, talk, talk right now. So I just want you to know, they're not coming tomorrow, but we are talking about them and I'm sharing that with Linda Joy uh, Harris because it's a planned opportunity. Philadelphia has over 50,000 African Caribbean immigrants living in our city from 35 different countries and growing. We have a large, and where we are in West and Southwest Philadelphia, over 50% of the population are African and Caribbean immigrants. So we're growing, and uh, we hope to continue that and to build on this success. So that's one thing aside. Secondly, as you can see here, you know, I, I'm learning every day, women hold up half the sky. And it's an honor to be here uh, with all the dynamic women who some I know have done some fantastic things, some people I'm getting to know have already done some things. And we hope that this type of forum will be helpful to you uh, going forward. Main thing I hear, whether it's for men or women, two issues. One is access to capital, the other one is technical assistance and marketing, and really helping to do business plans and development. So I'm happy that uh, Victoria has some office here from the Minority Business Development Authority and the Enterprise Center to help us do that. We'll get some information there and some all of the other people from this finance entity. And we have the opportunity to hear from uh, Ms. Harper. Uh, who is the director of the Office of Economic Opportunity for the City of Philadelphia. You know, one of the things that the city and the council lady members of, council lady Blackwell, members of the city council have done is a requirement for every construction project that goes up, they must file, if it's over a certain amount, must file an equal opportunity, equal opportunity plan. And that plan must stipulate the level of minority participation, women-owned businesses, disabled business, so for all of you that are in business or wanting to go into business, there's a road map to get you there uh, in terms of what future opportunities are in the city. So where you're sitting right here, I mentioned the airport going on, but from right here to Brandywine, there's about another $10 billion worth of construction going up just around the Drexel campus, Amtrak, and on. So there's multi-million dollars worth, billions of dollars worth of work, and we want to help you be prepared uh, to participate in that market. And this is the first of many uh, workshops, forums we will do to help stabilize your business. We, we talk about international often, but I want you to understand that with the ticket, with the price of the ticket go from here to Africa, we need to make sure you solid business here, making money here and moving forward. So this is one of the other objectives that we would like to have this done. So uh, let me uh, ask uh, my president to come forward I want to thank all of you for being here. We hope to have uh, Councilwoman Blackwell here soon. She's in route for, for, for greetings. But uh, for all of you, I want to thank you again for coming. 
at being a part of this very important program. I want to thank uh, Victoria and the other members of the team for being here. And uh, I won't take the personal privilege to introduce most of you since I know you, but let me just say to all of you, some very dynamic uh, people in our audience, and also make sure you network with each other, because I'm sure you can walk away with some very positive things. So Victoria, please, need some more instructions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. Okay, for now, at this time, we would like to welcome our entrepreneurs to the stage uh, to sit up front of the upper table. We'd like to welcome Christine Mako, we'd like to welcome Ms. Edith Waters Wilson, Dr. Leticia McKenzie, and Ms. Astudio. As I get assembled, get assembled, one of the things uh, uh, people, everybody wants to know is how did you do it? Nobody there to help you, you have a family to raise, you got things to do, you got big ideas. So the question is, what did you go through to get to, get to this uh, level of accomplishment, first of all? And secondly, uh, what kind of support network that you have out there to go to? And these are people you should be talking to, and I'm glad that they can spend some time these people making money, they don't take time to go to no meetings, okay? They got a business to take in. But I want to thank them for taking the time to be here and, and being a part of this. So you will learn more about the, their success and the trials and tribulations of being successful and what more they need to do to take their business uh, enterprise to the next level. So we'll do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we're going to as we know, uh, as uh, immigrants in this country, we all have a unique story to tell. We are already winners by being here, uh, let alone being here and being uh, brilliantly successful. So we want to take the opportunity to find out what these wonderful ladies here have uh, gone through uh, in order to be able to run the successful enterprises that they run at this time. Uh, I'm going to start from the left to the right. Uh, to my right, to your first left, is Ms. Astu Duo. She's the owner of Kumba African Hair Braiding. Uh, to uh, her right is Christine, <laughs> Christine Mako. She's a co-founder of uh, uh, Caring Hearts Home Healthcare down in Sharia, Pennsylvania. And her partner, her business partner, Ms. Uh, Edith Waters Wilson. And, uh, and by the way, let me mention where everybody's from. Um, Astu, what, what country are you from again? Astu, what country? Oh, Senegal. Oh, Ms. Astu is from Senegal. Ms. Christine and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Edith are both from Liberia. And Ms. Uh, Leticia is from Jamaica. Uh, Ms. Leticia, by the way, is the director of the uh, uh, Physical therapy firm, rehabilitation, life and health, strength, physical, uh, rehabilitation. I'm not saying it again. Anyway, um, we would like to take the opportunity to ask them some questions. So I'll start with uh, Ms. Uh, Astu. Please tell us um, how you started, what company you, um, you know, the trials and tribulations, uh, how did you get started in business, I'm just saying. Um, I came here, it was like um, 2000. One, I was in my own shop in West Virginia, that's where I started like, um, managing the shop, braiding. But I used to braid when I was a student back in France. And uh, I managed a shop for um, three years, and we moved to Philadelphia, and that's where I uh, opened. My aunt was like another uh, aunt was selling her shop, and that's how I got to the shop on I mean, um, Aldi. It's on table. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kenya. Uh, we'll take uh, the question down to Ms. Uh, Christine. Nicole, how did you get started in business? What's your background? My name is Christine Nicole, and my background is um, marketing. Um, Edith, my business partner and 
sister friend. <laughs> We've been friends for well over, we forget, 30 years. <laughs> we don't count, we don't count anymore. So really we just say we're sisters because that, that's, that's what we are. Um, but my background is in marketing and in this accounting. And Carrie Hearts is not our first rodeo. We tried so many things before that fell flat. We picked ourselves up and laughed ourselves out of it and looked for the next opportunity and we, we just kept moving. We are not only doing carry cards here, we also have Inspire Gen International in Liberia. Um, but to answer Victoria's question, we, we just knew that there was something more and something different for us. We just knew that we wanted to be in control of our own destiny. We knew that we wanted to be in a position to be able to help and to provide more. And that's the reason why we came across this organization, the African American Business Council, and we were able to get a lot of help and support from, from ACBC. But we got started because we wanted just a little bit more an alternative to the Okay, so like, you know, Christine said, my name is Edith Walters Wilson. Um, originally from Liberia, Christine and I are from Liberia. Again, you know, we've been friends forever. We're now sisters, uh, family. So we've done a whole lot of things together. Um, my background is accounting. Uh, came to the United States years ago, went to school in New York, graduated from this college, and then came to Philadelphia. Worked for one of the biggest uh, cable companies in Philadelphia, uh, Comcast, for 21 years. And, you know, when you work for someone else, your future and your destiny is in their hands. And, you know, to this day, I thank God for Comcast, and I thank God for the opportunities that I've had and the opportunities that Comcast have given me. But while at Comcast, I always had a plan B. You always have to have a plan B. And we always wanted to go into business. Our plan B was business. No matter what type of business it was, we knew that one day we had that vision that we're going to go into business. And so, you know, we tried different things. And when that time came, again, when you're in corporate America, your future and destiny is in your hands. I was at Comcast for 21 years, and I watched how the face of the company changed. And it changed. And it went from a family-oriented business to you being just a number. And then we knew that time has come to make the next, next move. And with proper planning, I mean, it just all came together. You know, and with her marketing background and my financial background, we knew we were in any business. All you have to do is hire the right people. You don't have to be a doctor or nurse to run, you know, a medical business. So our business is Karen Hart's Healthcare Services, where we provide services, um, non-medical and medical services. We hire um, nurses and physical therapists, occupational therapists, as well as home health aides. And, you know, we have grown so much. Well, three, we started three and a half years ago. In the very first year, we doubled, you know, our income. First of all, we made like, I would say half a million, and we were like, oh my God, we can do this. So we put more into it, and next year it doubled, and the next year it doubled, and then I was like, okay, you know what? Time to be out of here and do our own thing, and so that's what we did. <laughs> Very interesting uh, <laughs> story there. Uh, we'll translate the same very same question to Dr. Tisha. Tisha, could you kind of share your background when you got started? So um, I decided to open a physical therapy practice after graduated from Temple University with my doctorate in physical therapy. I worked for some of the prominent health systems here in Philadelphia. Um, I didn't like the type of care that I was providing. Um, a lot of the ma major hospitals, they require you to focus on productivity, where my patients were more so a number as opposed to an actual physical person. So I took it upon myself. I also have a business partner. She's not here yet. Um, and between the two of us, we just decided to commit ourselves to a neighborhood that we could provide quality, um, effective physical therapy for. And that's how we came to be. I'm inspired already from the session. It's very dramatic <laughs> stories. Thank you so much. Wow. We'll take it back to uh, our student.
as to coming into this country, what barriers did you run into trying to operate or start a business? Um, the first barrier was like the language. Because uh, my background was like, we learn in Senegal, back in Senegal, the second language was French. I'd grown up in French, French Paris, and the, the, the language first, and then uh, financially. But I went to school, to school for English um, at community college for like a year to, um, but I dropped school. I didn't finish it because I was working at the same time and get married, have kids, and I dropped school. But um, the barrier, the first barrier was like, final, like to f the, I think the language and then money. We, but I, I, I'm, my community is like, we're doing like a susu, trying to help each other if you want to open a business or stuff like that. They um, give you, you can borrow money and then you can pay monthly. That's how um, I start. I was working at my aunt for three years and saving a lot of money, knowing that I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. Even back in France, that's like, I was um, doing my friend's hair like on the weekends. I always, always knew that I wanted to do hair. That's, even at school, I know that one day, and I was coming here back and forth for just vacation and helping my aunt. Um, and then when I come, I managed her shop for three years. And after that, I said, let me, I saved enough money and I said, let me just open my own shop. That's how it was. Thank you. Christine, I'll translate right there to you. What barriers did you run into trying to open a uh, new business? For us, I don't know if I can necessarily say that we ran into any major barriers because of the attitude we took. And our attitude was always, and this is what, one of the things that have propelled us, was we always say we are the ones who want something. So if I call you and you don't answer that phone, I'm going to call you 10 times in that, if that's what it takes. So it was more of the attitude that, that, that we took. So it was, we always knew that there's, there's a way. If, if it has to be, there's a way. I just have to find that way. And I cannot tell you how many times through the last three and a half years that we've had amazing aha moments where, you know, something will suddenly become clear and we'll look at each other and be like, wow, so that's how you do it. So it's, it's just having that stick to it just seeing it through. If you're going to start, see it to the end. And it's going to look sometimes like, you know, you've, you've met a roadblock, but just know that you can't stop. Just know that right around the corner, it's, it's a clear opening. You know, there's, there's a new day. As, as surely as nighttime comes, the day will dawn. So you just have to know that if you don't give up on what it is that you're going after, what you're going after will surely find you. Hmm. It is. Okay, so just to add to Christine, we have really one voice here. <laughs> but just to add to Christine and to add a twist onto what Christine said, in the beginning, you know, trying to start a new business or, or, or just venturing out into something that's completely out of your league, right? Um, for lack of a better word. Um, she's marketing, I'm accounting. What are we doing in the medical field? You know? Um, you know, we have a lot of people tell us, oh, you can't do that. You can't do it. It's not going to work. You, it's not going to be successful. Oh, you're earning a great income right now. You know, you're doing so well in the corporate world. Why would you want to do that? Even the tax lady, lady who does our taxes, when she looks at the, the you know, W-2, why do you want to leave? Why do you want to do this? You know? But you have to have a vision. You know in your mind, you know where your, your, your future, your destiny is, you know? In life, you have stepping stones, you know? And, and life is a journey, you know? So you have to travel your journey. You know, the, the jobs that we had was, we went to school for those jobs. And then you get to a point and you said, what's next? You know, what's next? And, and, and in, the, in, in a country like this, with all the opportunities, you know, if you have a vision, a dream, just go after it. If it doesn't work the first time, the second time, it's eventually going to work. Whatever you attract to yourself is going to come to you. Congratulations. 
um, obstacles that I encounter, first and foremost, starting with um, the profession itself. Physical therapy is a Caucasian male dominated profession, so I don't fit that quota. <laughs> but um, you know, just overcoming the obstacles and just making your presence known, um, knowing your material, you just have to be confident in that respect. So that's an obstacle. From a business standpoint, obstacles that we overcame was, of course, um, how do you get involved? A lot of people don't openly tell you how to get credentialed with insurance companies. People don't want to share you know, their rates and how did they negotiate to get the appropriate reimbursements from the different types of insurance companies. Because insurance companies are not openly saying, oh, sure, come on and <laughs> credential with us. It's a lot of loops, a lot of barriers. And you know, like these two ladies just expressed, you have to be determined. You just have to keep networking until somebody um, gives you that guidance to get started. Thank you. Let me just recognize two people before I raise my questions. Uh, please say hello to Mr. Vita Hill, the director of the Mayor's Office of Women's Good. Just raise your hand and say hello. And I wanted to introduce you also to Simple all from the Office of Immigrant Affairs in the City of Philadelphia, we'll be mm -hmm. here from later, just for recognizing our thank colleagues you. and our working group, so thank you very much. Um, two things I just heard and I wanted to be re back on to have you ladies respond to. Uh, the first one related to, uh, with, uh, He's the chairman related to the Susu uh, of that ACPC. that Dion talked about. Yeah, which is and that's sort of, well, you know, for those of us who are not into Africa culture completely, you know, it's something that I think you can help our people here to understand a little more about and import the importance of it in the society. But that point also, I want to leave to other each of you a question about the raising of capital and how you want to, how that helps you. What are the impediments to raising capital? Because you have overcome whatever they are. So I want to congratulate you for being here and getting that far. And Christine, I'm going to make sure you guys pay your dues, ACBC, before y'all leave, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but let me say one more thing before Madam Diop uh, answered the question and started off. I do know from Christine and, uh, and uh, Edith what they're doing. In addition to doing this business, um, I know that she's a member of the Liberia Medical Mission, and uh, they do work every year to raise money to take a medical mission to Liberia for how long? How many weeks? Three weeks for one time. So they're not only doing business here and taking care of their business and their families, but they're also working back home. And the, the secret of nearly all immigrants in the United States, whether they come from Africa, Jamaica, or whatever, when you look at the amount of money they have to work and live off here, many of them are sending money back home to take care of family, friends, school fees. So this is something that's very that's not as well known in the community, but if you're involved, you know when you look at you know somebody sending money home, and that's a very important aspect of uh, the work that that's here. Secondly, with respect to how much money you send home, it is a huge amount of money. Just in West Africa alone, coming from the United States, over 60 billion dollars in remittances are sent back home. That's not every place in the world. This is from the United States to Africa. I've been working on a project with the World Bank about these remittances that we see their economic impact in the villages, the cities uh, back home in Africa. So for many immigrants and the, and the things that you're doing, I want to thank you for being here and also thank you for what you're doing back home. Uh, and then finally, the other part of this is, how can myself and ACBC and Victoria help you help yourself as we continue to go forward uh, and move forward? So let me just stop there and ask Madam Diap to talk just a little bit about the SUSU and raising money uh, for your business to get started and also for the, each of you to take that, okay? Yeah. Actually, the SUSU is like, um, I'm not going to say organization, but it's like, let's say it's um, 20 people okay. and everybody, we, um, like I said, somebody wanted to open a shop, somebody wanted to, like a wedding, and then it's 20 people each week or each month is like a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, depending of how um, how um, soon you want the money. He's just gonna ask. He's gonna be like ahead somebody who's gonna um, carry the money. And every month or every week, the, um, 
let me give an example. If like I'm ahead of the, the Susu money, is like every week, like 20 people are gonna bring me like, like let's say $500. So one of each other gonna, like somebody gonna say that, oh, I have a wedding in one month, or I wanted to open a shop like this week. So we'll see who's uh, coming first. So if it's like 20 people, each, each person, um, giving us like five hundred dollars, so it's all together is gonna be probably like five thousand or more, and then we're gonna give it to that person so they can do whatever, like the wedding. I'm just giving an example for the money, the wedding or opening a shop or doing her business or traveling, going back home, doing vacation, and then every month is like borrowing money, and every month you're gonna just pay back or every week, and um, that's how we and help each other to um, to open the business or to do whatever you wanted to do. And it's just one person, but at the end, you have to just give us something because like she's holding the money, she might lose some or something can happen. That's how, that's how I opened my business from the Susu money. And still now we're still doing it to do whatever you wanted to do, vacation, or saving for the kids or stuff like that because some people they don't want to go to the bank they don't want to save um, they don't know how to you know hold the money and that's how the community that's how we have so oh. we, we do it like all the bread like hair cool. breaders or we can do it um, friend it can be like five people it can be ten depending on how it's much like you need unit. that's what we do wow. that's right. mm -hmm. Let's say something. Good. You have a question? I have a question on the SUSU. Okay. I just want you to know that the SUSU is illegal trading mm -hmm. of currency in this country. Therefore, that's why when we are doing it, we don't let people know where we meet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Because you could be arrested okay. for doing illegal trading because you're taking the money from the bank and from the US government. Everybody wow. have it. The, 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 the Koreans have it with yeah, different yeah. names, but we meet at certain locations, mm -hmm. and we are the only people that know. That's why I'm just telling you where it's been done. <laughs> so <laughs> it's something to let people know, but it's something not to broadcast. So it's called self-financing, okay? Right. That's the name we're going to give it, self-financing. <laughs> Christine, you and uh, you didn't want to talk about this a bit. So for Edith and I, um, we went to the trusted 401ks <laughs> when we got started. Um, she was, sometimes she would trade some stocks, you know, when you have people working for you and then two weeks, nobody had the time to hear, you know, what you didn't do or didn't have to do, they just want to get paid. And that was the end of the story. And I'm so happy to say that from the day we started to now, everyone has always gotten paid and there were nights when we were looking at each other and scratching our heads but we just knew that the funds had to be there and we found a way to make sure that it was there and yes we did the susu thing too sometimes <laughs> because <laughs> Edith's mom was having a susu and we'll tap into that and, and, and yeah so it, 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 it worked for us so that's what we were able to do you know? Uh, so, you know, pretty much like uh, the young lady said about Susu, you know... Um, I don't think it's illegal. <sighs> Dr. Kwate, I know you said it's illegal tra trading. People? However, I think it's become so um, widespread in America so that even the banks know about Susu. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, sometimes you go to buy a house and they see a, a lump sum of money and they ask you, oh, well, where did you... You know, have to explain, you know, where all deposits and stuff. And when you say Susu, to my surprise, the bank knows about Susu. <laughs> you know? <laughs> really? Yeah, they, 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 and they, they do know about Susu. You know, so when you say Susu, yeah, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, the Africans, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, you know? So, um, it, again, it's just like, you know, everybody just putting their money into a, it's just a, a it's called mandatory saving. You know, because if you took that money and you put it in the bank, as I know, the bank machine is not going to rest. You know, something comes up, you go, you see a new purse, you want to get it. But if that money is in the susu, you can't just get it out. So it forces you to save. And I've participated in susus for many years. I've built houses on susu. So, you know, I, I think the susu is a good thing. 
So, um, growing up Jamaican, we don't call it Susu, they call it partner, but it's the same concept. <laughs> it's the same concept. Um, so, I had the benefit of it, you know, because my parents used that to help put me through school.